Good morning, everybody. Is this working all right? Yes. Okay, great, great. Well, I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving and are getting ready for the holidays here coming up. Um, hopefully, we will not be rained on as we exit today, so we'll try to, not to keep you up uh, held up too long. Uh, uh, thanks for coming this morning. Uh, my name is Brett Martin, and I uh, want to take a couple minutes to introduce the agenda. We're going to have uh, 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 several topics for you today. Uh, Jean McElroy will be uh, talking about communications updates in uh, Amanda's absence, and we'll have an, an announcement for about Amanda's uh, new son. Uh, Russell Fredericks will talk about some of our projects that are coming up. Uh, David will go uh, into detail about uh, other events that are happening as well as uh, things that are happening on the beach just to keep everybody posted on what we're doing out there after the storms and uh, all this OCRM different uh, uh, topics that have come up recently. And then uh, Toby will talk about safety and security, do a little recap decal renewals when that will be occurring uh, and then some safety tips. Uh, we will end the meeting at that time uh, for about five minutes and then come back for Q&A. Just a reminder for the Q&A at the end is to please wait for the microphones. Gene and David will be coming to you so that we can get your questions on uh, video as well as on the uh, audio uh, for everybody else to hear and see. Okay, um, uh, just a quick reminder. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Victoria decided she wanted to do a, uh, or actually was asked to do a, uh, a budget um, review of what we do, what the process is. So she put that together and then she took vacation, so I get to give it. So uh, we're going to do it at the beginning, so if you fall asleep, we will wake you up later about what we do in the budget process. Uh, annual assessment mailer will be going out sometime next week, so that will be coming to you at your uh, address of record uh, in our record. So if you have a change, can't hear? Is that better? Okay. If you have a change of address, please let us know prior to that so we can get that mailing updated as soon as possible. Okay, without further ado, we'll get into the budget process. Let's go ahead to the next one. Um, you know, this, this process goes on really, realistically all year. We're, we're looking at existing budget as well as next year's budget, and we're gathering through a variety of inputs, including the department directors and the goals and objectives that are established by uh, myself and the board, as well as uh, committee recommendations that come through the committee process. And we integrate that into basically uh, um, a, a with uh, other additional items like the long-range strategic plan, our reserve study, and the hydrology study now that we've completed last year to build out the plan. Uh, the initial draft of an uh, expenditure bud budget is essentially a wish list. When we first bring all this together, nobody's really uh, um, had a chance to look at setting out a goal of any type. Those goals are set based on the committees and the uh, directors and the things that have come up throughout the year that we put down on paper, okay? And it, it becomes a, a pretty big uh, uh, list of ideas and concepts as well as our existing services that we provide all the time um, already. So uh, needs for existing capital asset replacements are, are taken into consideration with the reserve study, uh, major repairs and replacements such as road and leisure trail replacements or bridge repairs comes through that, enhancements or additions such as new leisure trails, landscaping of a major roadway or a major project of some sort, and then new capital assets related to new initiatives such as the Greenwood Gate reconfiguration, those types of things uh, all get listed out as the initial draft. Then we get to review it. So I go through it, uh, uh, Victoria goes through it, and Dave Borghese as our treasurer goes through that to try to get a feel for what everybody is asking for, uh, what those uh, ideas are, and then look at a line item review of what we have uh, already. We're making comparisons to prior year budget uh, as well as our actual year forecast and looking for significant changes that are coming through there that uh, may be additional manpower requests, those types of things from uh, different committees or different objectives. Uh, salaries and wages 
are approximately 60% of our operating costs, not including major projects, or about 45 to 50% of all expenses, uh, including major repairs and replacements. So, you know, labor's a big thing. So we go through man, man plans, look at our hours of operation, look at what, we're, what services we're providing and what services are being requested and try to allocate uh, uh, those ideas into the first round of the budget process. So we try to figure out how much money we have what our financial resources are. Uh, we look at our long range seven year forecast of future operating revenues and expenses. So we, we cast out into the future so that we understand how much we're gonna be drawing down in the future based off of uh, the current needs uh, that we anticipate to happen in the, the long run, as well as all of the things that we're doing today. Uh, the reserve study performed in 2016 is updated. So a couple things on that. Uh, when we did the original reserve study, it came back to us, for example, uh, one of the things was on equipment. And it looked at life of the equipment and it put it into years. Well, we know that life of equipment is probably better measured in hours of operation. So we go back through and we audit that and we look at what the expected life of a piece of equipment is and look at how many miles it might be on a vehicle or how many operating hours that a piece of equipment has been through already so that we can update that and get a better idea of when that replacement time is going to be. So our uh, accounting team goes out and actually goes with the maintenance guys and they go look at all the uh, uh, equipment and get the hours off of it as well as the mileage off of it so we understand how much useful life we have used so we can plan for when that needs to be replaced in the future. Um, okay. A revised budget draft is presented to the Finance Committee for detailed review and comment. The Finance Committee is currently comprised of residential property owners, uh, officers of the board who are also, and officers of the board who are also residential property owners. So that's who the, the, is the vetting uh, um, organization to get us before we go to the board and to review the budget. Issues of both operational and major projects are vetted. Priorities are discussed, adjustments are recommended, or spending placed in abeyance until further information can be accumulated. So a lot of stuff, if it's in the current year, if it's in a current request, we may move out. Even though it may be valuable, it just isn't something we're going to do next year. So a lot of things gets, get pushed out into future years. Most of those are the enhancement components. We keep the reserve study and now the hydrology study as more of a current um, um, input for our operating expenses and capital expenses. So we try to replace those things first, and then we look at enhancements. Second budget review is performed with input from the committees as to the level of expenditures and priorities. So that feedback comes from the uh, um, uh, finance committee back to the other committees, and the, the major one is generally our, our major um, MEMP committee, which is our major enhancements and special projects committee, which reviews, you know, the big things, the, the roadways, uh, the uh, uh, big enhancements that uh, are, may be proposed, and any other capital equipment replacements to make sure that it's ready, needs to be replaced. Okay. Uh, the long-term analysis of projected future capital reserve funds is reviewed. So we, we actually look at what are the funds coming in, what are our operating expenses, project how much cash we will generate each year that we can contribute to this fund that we have for capital replacement. And we draw down that fund and or will contribute excesses to that fund, anticipating future expenses over and below the current cash needs or the cash uh, available from current year operations. Um, okay, so we're down to the end here. The Finance Committee is satisfied that the budget is sufficient to meet the operational and capital needs of CSA. It makes a formal recommendation to the CSA Board of Directors to accept the budget as presented. The Board either approves the budget or approves the budget with changes to the recommendations. And that's what happened at the last not special board meeting, but the last board meeting. We got the 2018 budget. So what does that look like? This is where the 2018, or this is what happened in 1997. I think we've got that just from a historical perspective. So back in 1997, 
and it doesn't show the uh, residential assessment percentage, but I believe it was 72% uh, of all revenues and the rest was made up by other uh, revenue sources. In 2018, here we are. So we've got 53% of the re revenue comes from residential assessments. We have 3.2 million from daily gate passes and other and annual passes is another 830,000. So a lot of money is coming from those other sources of revenues today uh, versus how it came in in the past. And then on the expense side, so you see where the the operations go, maintenance. Uh, includes about $3.4 million of expenses, not including the major repairs and replacements, uh, which is for next year, 2.6 million. Capital expenses for next year is 700,000. Uh, we have facility operations, which is this facility, Tower Beach, those, those things, uh, which is 437. Uh, we didn't get the, for some reason, that got changed on the safety and security on the dollar amount, but uh, that's a, just under, uh, I believe, the uh, right at three million, Tobe? Yes. So uh, that's those are our two major operations, trolley operations you see, and then administration, which includes uh, a variety of different uh, people, including our finance and um, administrative staff. I know you can't see this, so I just put it up there, but it's a, the, the general what we do, this is operating, so you have all the revenues. <laughs> You have all the revenues. This is posted on the website. I believe is already posted on the website. But uh, uh, this is the operating side of it. This is the stuff that we do day to day. Next slide. And that uh, I, on that slide, it it produced two million of additional cash that we could contribute to our funds or we spend through uh, big projects. And next year, the big project right now that's in the budget is the rebuild Greenwood Drive. And that is approved as we speak. We are going to see how the revenues go, as well as talk about what we're doing on Greenwood Drive. And I believe uh, later today in this presentation, Russell will talk a little bit about what we're doing with Greenwood Drive going forward. But we will have, uh, uh, because of that expense and because of what we think we're going to be doing, we'll have a, a meeting well before that to discuss that and open of what we're trying to accomplish. This is not an overlay. This is a rebuilding of the road. So this is a, a big project, probably about two months on Greenwood Drive. So not to mention the expense, you know, just think about the inconvenience. Uh, we don't want to do this very often. So this is going to be a big topic, I'm sure, for everybody to see, and we're going to try to communicate way out in front timing and when this will be happening and what the delays you can expect and alternate routes and those types of things. Uh, so, um, but it's, we want to let you know it's coming. So uh, if you look at Greenwood Drive today, you'll see, you know, it's, it's in pretty rough shape. And we've got a number of issues there uh, as to the condition of the roadway, the roadbed, uh, as well as drainage issues that uh, are run throughout that corridor. Okay, so this is uh, where we, st well, we anticipate finishing the year in our, our uh, fund balance. Uh, about 9.2 million in cash or cash equivalents. That doesn't include operating equipment and other assets that we have. This is just liquid, semi-liquid uh, investments in cash. Uh, we would draw down from that about 1.2 million. And uh, as you saw, 2 million of that's going into uh, Greenwood Drive. And then at the end of uh, 2019, we'd have about 8 million in cash reserves uh, moving forward. So the, the finance uh, committee is reviewing that. We'll probably have some additional recommendations on how we uh, may have to change some things in the future because of the drawdown this year, but we don't anticipate it to be something that we can't handle. Uh, and obviously Greenwood Drive is a, a pretty major asset for us to take care of. Okay. Uh, so with that, that's the, the review of that. We'll do questions a little bit later. I did want to make a quick announcement also before I turn it over to Gene, right? Uh, I just want to let everybody know that Beverly Serrell is uh, exiting the board at the end of this year. We wish her the best in her future. We thank her immensely for the contributions she made, and we just uh, want to 
uh, make the announcement, let you know that Beverly is, is terming out on her uh, term and did not run for CSA board again. So thanks, and I'm going to turn it over to Jean. Jean, you're going to talk about communications and uh, new events. Good morning. Oh, really? <laughs> Good morning. Is that better? <laughs> I, as uh, Brett has said, I am filling, uh, or supposed to be trying to fill, Amanda's big shoes. And just to let you know, I wear a size five and a half. So I might be shuffling along a little bit, but I will continue to move forward and um, get you answers and get your work done for you. The neat thing about my being here is that I am able to give Amanda some time and the reason that I'm here has a name and his name is Clayton Alexander. And Clayton <laughs> Clayton came into the world uh, November 30th at a big eight pounds, six ounces and they are all doing very fine. So I'm very, I'm very proud, actually, that I can give her some time at home with her family. So in the meantime, let me just fill you in on a couple of um, items for communication. Don't have many, but I do want you to be aware that our holiday closings are coming up faster than we can even imagine. The Christmas closings will be December 22nd, we will close at 2 o'clock, and then we will, of course, be closed for Christmas Day, the 25th, on Monday, and again on Tuesday, the 26th. Then for New Year's, we will be closing on the Friday at 2 o'clock again. That would be the 29th, and we will be closed for the 1st, obviously, and then we will be back to work at 7.30 on Tuesday morning, the 2nd. So just to give you a heads up, I will be posting these and also, of course, sending out some emails as reminders so that you don't inconvenience yourself and come to the office when we actually are home enjoying our families. The next thing I wanted to mention is that our um, quarterly, fourth quarter actually, newsletter is being mailed as we speak. And so be looking for that if you have subscribed to get the hard copy. I will be posting the uh, digital copy in uh, the magazine format that we use so it's very handy to read and you don't really lose any value. Um, that will be posted tomorrow, so be looking for those. The election, we're all aware of the election coming to a close. The um, Elliot Davis, CPA, that is telling our ballots, has told us that it, give, give them about 10 days from the closing date. So when we get the results, of course, the candidates will be notified first, and then immediately afterwards, we will have it posted on the website, and I will send out an email blast also. So be looking for that. I do want to take a minute, though, to just thank the candidates, all of the candidates, because the amount of time that they have put into keeping you informed about where they stand on issues so that you could make an intelligent decision based on your values and your goals for the community, I think is incredible. And so we thank all of them for their efforts and um, wish them all the best. Uh, then the other thing is we want uh, to tell you that we will be doing a couple of surveys after the beginning of the year. One of them, we will be collecting information from you about different categories that influence our goals, how we're going to plan to, to move forward and to uh, take into consideration what, oh, excuse me, what you want to do. There's a real fine line here be, between being heard and being crashing. <laughs> um, so that survey will be coming out at the, be uh, 
middle of January or so. We're not quite sure, but we'll get it all together and ask if you would cooperate and give us your feedback. That's the only way we know what you want. Um, and it'll be based on different categories so that each section will be very apparent what you are answering and what it's related to. And then the other survey that we're anxious to get out is a, uh, a gate traffic survey. And you remember when we sent out that long survey and you, were an and you had all kinds of maps and you were telling us what bothered you the most and what didn't bother you at all and so on. Well, we have taken all of those results and come up with the four uh, areas that, or the four situations, I should say, that um, bother you, that are annoying to you, that really just set you off. And um, I, it's hard to narrow down to four, I understand that. But, we, but actually, four of them of them actually really stand out. There's really quite a difference between the, you know, after the fourth and then the rest of them. So it made us, it made it a little clearer for us. So we have gone back and we are getting uh, different situations uh, mapped out again, um, remedies, so to speak. And obviously when you take care of one thing, you may not take care of something else. So that's why we want to go back to you and say, here are the four top um, priorities to you, and here are some um, ways that we might resolve those situations, and then have you again tell us what you agree with and what you don't, so that we have some further detail about how we should move forward with um, handling those situations. And the last thing, this is near and dear to my heart because I get so many emails that people say we didn't get this message or get that message. Please keep your email addresses um, current with the office. So if you have had a change, just let us know. Um, you can call the office at the main number or you can email info at csacpines.com and we will update it in our database. You don't want to miss the election information. You don't want to miss these surveys and other information that goes out. The other thing is, if you, if you feel like your email is current and you're still not getting it, then there's another issue. So please call again, and we will try to resolve that. Okay? All right. Now I'm going to turn it over to Russell. Russell Fredericks, who is the Director of Maintenance, and he's going to give you an update. Thank you, Jean. Good morning, everybody. Good. Um, just wanted to take a, a few moments to review a project uh, that's been discussed uh, quite routinely and often. I uh, just wanted to thank all the property owners that re turned out recently um, back in the middle of November to discuss the Greenwood and South Sea Pines intersection. We had some really great feedback from everyone um, and just wanted to make everyone aware that we are going to be moving forward with construction after the holidays, very early spring, um, regarding the intersection itself uh, to change the geometry that we've uh, spoken about quite often, uh, install this new uh, landscape island. Um, and do this reconfiguration that's very necessary to improve safety in the area. Uh, we'll be installing a, a, a bunch of other signage as well, warning signs, uh, to improve the safety of the intersection. Uh, so again, uh, this, is, this is moving forward. Uh, it has been approved uh, throughout, through all our committees and right up to the board uh, most recently. Um, so you'll see those changes. One of the changes that you'll notice is the, uh, the post and chain fence uh, has been removed. Um, so we have uh, received some uh, feedback on that, uh, and most of that being very positive uh, with that post and chain uh, uh, coming down. One of the things that we did discuss in this, uh, the meeting on the, on the 15th uh, was the addition of uh, uh, two, two uh, timber bridges over the lagoon that would uh, uh, allow access uh, for pedestrians coming down the leisure trail and crossing over to these uh, beach walks. These are... Uh, 20, beach Walk 25 and 26 happen to be two of the beach walks in Sea Pines that are, are uh, obstructed uh, from access by that lagoon. We intend on uh, stamping 
the crosswalks across Greenwood Drive, uh, Sea Pines Drive, again to improve safety, uh, along with stamping the uh, crosswalk uh, down at Beachwalk 24. So again, this is all in the effort to uh, improve uh, public safety in the area. Uh, and uh, regarding the construction of the bridges, uh, we'll be moving forward uh, in the engineering process in the, in the, new, in the new year on that. Um, so that, that's uh, an exciting project for the uh, coming season. A uh, recent, uh, recent project that we've completed on um, Plantation Drive, uh, we just recently finished up all the thermostriping and installing of roadway markers. We actually have a little bit more to do um, with some of the raised roadway uh, reflectors on the side of the road. Uh, we should be installing those hopefully next week, uh, weather permitting. Um, and here we uh, just uh, installed a, uh, crossed, uh, uh, a stamp crosswalk at uh, the corner of Plantation and Greenwood uh, as well. So that's a, a very interesting process uh, um, and something, that, again, that uh, will Im improve uh, public safety in the area. Uh, open space mulching, uh, you have probably have seen this, uh, um, again, on Plantation Drive over in proximity to Calabogie K. We're uh, Lighthouse Road, and we're currently working on Greenwood Drive uh, and putting a fresh layer of mulch throughout the community uh, to spruce things up. So this is going very well. We'll be continuing right through Christmas and, and on into the new year uh, with this effort. So it's a, a small project back in the uh, club, club course community. Uh, we recently repaired and rebuilt the Acorn Otter Bridge. Uh, we're, in the, we're waiting for the uh, pressure-treated pressure treated wood to actually dry before we go ahead and stain and paint the bridge. Uh, so that uh, should be happening soon. Um, but again, this uh, this project was uh, recently completed. Holiday holiday lighting, um, and uh, we worked out a couple bugs that we had early on uh, once we completed the installation. But the uh, you'll see the lights on uh, every evening, right through the holidays, uh, to spread that holiday cheer. And uh, both at Sea Pine Circle, Fraser, and, and a couple other key locations throughout the community. Uh, Greenwood, Greenwood Drive resurfacing. Uh, Brett mentioned this briefly um, in his presentation. Uh, so this is a very complex and uh, um, project. And I, I could certainly share more details uh, moving forward, um, but the reconstruction um, involves quite a bit. Uh, the Greenwood Drive, the um, actually underneath that roadway, um, is uh, what they call a soil cement. Uh, so, you know, during construction many, many years ago, the, the proper base of that road is not adequate to support vehicle traffic, uh, you know, over the course of time. So, uh, we actually brought in a uh, geotechnical company to execute roadway borings and uh, to bore into the road, see what we had underneath. Based on those results, uh, we need to actually reinforce that road. Uh, also, the, uh, the curb and gutter that's presently on the side of the road actually holds water. And as Brett mentioned, is also you know, that's affecting the drainage on the road. The goal of the project is to remove this curb and gutter uh, from the roadway, and the road will, will look very much like Plantation Drive lo looks today with, with no uh, rolled curb uh, to allow the water to, uh, to uh, leave the roadway. Um, and as I said, the, the reinforcing of the road is in many, many areas. Uh, to, uh, and that's something to support that road for the, the next 25 years. Um, you, you know, this approach is, uh, differs greatly from just performing an overlay. The overlay of the road could possibly last us about eight, eight or ten years. Um, but again, the, this is a more extensive renovation, and, and as Brett mentioned, about possibly a two-month pro project weather permitting, uh, and we're looking towards next fall. There's a lot of engineering and permitting uh, work to do before we get to that point. Um, and a lot, a lot of logistics to work out with uh, Toby and his team in security and traffic rerouting and, and making sure that uh, everyone has access along that roadway to uh, to their homes. So uh, we'll be working through that process in the in the coming months. S storm water, um, it's a subject that's on everyone's mind, and uh, more and more recently, uh, CSA spent uh, a lot of time bringing in, uh, Ray Pittman to perform the hydrology study. So we are going to be mo moving forward with uh, some additions to our staff and equipment, um, and that's uh, to, to handle the ongoing maintenance of the culvert pipes, uh, catch basins, outfalls, uh, working, working in conjunction with the town of Hilton Head. Um, 
And I do have one thing to uh, show you as well as we close the presentation on the um, some new information that we have from the town and with the drainage infrastructure. So again, this crew is, is going to have a variety of equipment uh, to be able to handle the ongoing uh, maintenance of cleaning out the pipes throughout the community. And I have to say there, there's a lot of catching up to do. It's going to take us many months and many years ahead to, to accomplish this. There's probably about 20 some odd years of, of, of maintenance to do in some of these areas that ditches that need to be cleaned out, um, pipes that need to be, uh, you know, a, a, line, a jitter that uh, needs to be run through. And that's what this big piece of equipment that we're looking here on your left side, on the left side of the screen there, it's a, what they call a vacuum extractor and something that will be a key piece of equipment for us uh, here in Sea Pines moving forward. And we also have access to contractors that will be assisting us with some of the larger diameter pipes as we move uh, throughout the community. Uh, just uh, a couple other projects uh, to mention in, in closing. Uh, North Sea Pines Drive, uh, we spoke about Greenwood Drive, but North Sea Pines Drive is, is needs a lot of work. Um, we're going to be executing um, pothole repair in the coming week, uh, and that's another project that's in our 18 uh, budget forecast to perform some engineering and survey work on, and uh, something that uh, we'll be looking to repaving in, in the future um, as, the, as the roadway needs a lot of attention. Uh, Beach Lagoon dredging uh, is in progress, going well. We should be wrapping up by the middle of of uh, next week, hopefully, if weather permitting, and uh, see what this rain does to us in the next couple of days. Uh, the Monarch Leisure Trail, which is adjacent to Beach Lagoon Road, uh, is a project uh, we're starting on this week, and uh, we'll be uh, wrapping that up in the next uh, couple of weeks here. Boardwalk repair. Um, uh, we sent out an announcement that we're going to be repairing the boardwalk at 42A, um, which is starting today. And boardwalk extensions 11 and 12 will be very early spring. Uh, sometime with a uh, uh, late spring uh, wrap up uh, that's about 800 feet of um, boardwalk to build on, in each uh, instance. So it's uh, quite a quite a project and going to take us some uh, time to accomplish that. And our you saw the uh, fall flower display has been recently co completed. Uh, so I'm just going to take a moment here to uh, show you. This is uh, the town of Hilton Head Sea Pines drainage map. Uh, this is, uh, they have a good amount of data that which they've been able to obtain and they're going to be working closely with our engineer Ray Pittman as uh, Ray has a lot of additional information to add to this map. So it's going to, it's going to be a work in progress, but the, the, the point I wanted to make this morning, uh, this really kind of gives us a substantial, uh, substantial information out in the field. Uh, we could use this on our iPads or smartphones um, and you could see here some of the drainage lines. Uh, and all these are labeled. Uh, you can see here on the right uh, what the you know, weirs and junctions and uh, culverts and, and so on and so forth. And this is for the entire community. Uh, we're certainly uh, we have a real advantage with this. As uh, Sea Pines is probably one of the community one of the communities in, in the town that has all this in information accessible. Uh, so this will be a tremendous asset to our new stormwater crew. Uh, and then moving forward to again leveraging this technology to, to allow us to understand where the where these pipes go, where they outfall, you know, where the outfalls are, and allow us to facilitate efficient uh, stormwater uh, repairs in conjunction with the uh, town of Hilton Head. So I uh, just wanted to share that today. And uh, again, it's something that's uh, going to really kind of uh, be dynamically change our, our, our operations uh, in maintenance. And just in closing, just uh, wanted to wish everyone a happy and safe holiday season ahead. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to Dave Henderson. Good morning. Good morning. Before I get into my uh, agenda, I wanted to go back to something Gene had mentioned earlier about the survey that we had done on traffic issues. And if you were curious, and the gate is an issue that affects all of us, I assume that you are, she had mentioned the top three or four issues that came out of the survey. So I thought I would just briefly discuss those with you. Want to start number one or number four? 
Let's start with number four. Uh, any guesses? What was that? Harris Teeter. That is, uh, that's Office Park Road, and that is definitely one that is uh, in the top four, but it's not number four. So, good guess. Uh, two of the four are related, closely related. So, number four, uh, in which people responded that they were either extremely concerned or moderately concerned. So, we sum those two numbers. Number four was vehicles stopping or slowing in the left lane while attempting to merge into the right lane. So these are folks at the gate that have figured out their error, but right at the bitter end. And so they are trying to get over. They've got the blinker on. They're trying to turn, but the right lane is stacked. They can't get over. You're trying to come through as a pass holder, and you can't get through. 73.1. Number three. At 84.2, difficulty turning left out of Office Park Road onto Greenwood Drive. So there's your Harris Teeter. Number two, 84.7, delays due to excessive backup attempting to enter the Sea Pine Circle. So that's a, that's, a, that's a tough one. And drum roll, please, number one at 85.7, related to the previous one that we just talked about, vehicles stopping in the left lane to purchase pass, get information, or turn around. So as Gene had mentioned, we're looking at, at these as the top four, but also others. And it is a complex environment up there in that you have multiple owners, multiple permissions, easements, uh, access and ownership rights so it is a challenge but we will be coming uh, forward uh, after the first of the year for information for you to consider as we attempt to address or to mitigate most of these issues so just thought you'd like to know that back to my official program i wanted to talk about reese across america program if you're not familiar with it encourage you to attend this is an annual initiative at Six Oaks Cemetery in which we cooperate with the National Wreaths Across America program. If you're not familiar with it, they're online. I encourage you to look at it. It's a wonderful program, and it's a very nice way to honor uh, the veterans uh, that have done so much for us. We will have the ceremony at Six Oaks Cemetery Saturday, December 16th. It is at 12 noon. It is open, free, available for you to participate. There will be a brief ceremony after which you will have an opportunity, should you choose to, to participate and to help place wreaths on every veteran's grave in Six Oaks Cemetery. You can also make a contribution to the Wreaths Across America program. We ask that you send it to Six Oaks Cemetery at that address, again, made payable to Wreaths Across America. We will consolidate that. We will send it into the national program that funds the reefs that we use at Six Oaks. And in many years, when we have adequate participation, we have excess funds that are then donated or those reeves are used in other cemeteries that may not be as fortunate as we are. But it's a great, uh, great way to honor our veterans and, and a neat event and encourage you all to attend if you can on December 16th at noon. All right, next one. We have our Sea Pines property owner holiday open house coming up very soon. This is coming Tuesday, December 12th from 3 to 6 p.m. at Tower Beach. We will have uh, hors d'oeuvres, beer and wine, non-alcoholic beverages, uh, hopefully it won't be too cold. The uh, event is really nice in that it's a great way, great environment, great setting to be able to kind of mix and mingle with your neighbors. We'll have a lot of staff there as well, and it's a nice social event. Uh, Tower Beach parking is limited, and we will be running a trolley from Parcel 1. There will be security on site to help direct you. Uh, we encourage people to carpool. We encourage you to walk or bike if you can, uh, but if you have to park, and Tower Beach is full. We do have overflow parking available with, with trolley service to uh, Tower Beach. All right, I'm going to finish with talking a little bit about the beach. This is a picture of the previous beach renourishment work as it was ongoing. I'm pleased to announce that this town project was officially completed on November 15th. The town contractor placed approximately 600,000 cubic yards of sand and this was done from Tower Beach to Duck Hawk. These are beach markers at Tower Beach, approximately 13, to Duck Hawk, approximately uh, beach marker 43. I also wanted to let you know that the moratorium on building new boardwalks has been lifted from beach marker 18 to the south. This is a pretty limited area. It is from Cedar Waxwing Road 
down to Land's End. So in those areas, if you had a need to repair or rebuild your beach walk post storms, you have the ability to do so. But frankly, that area of the beach and the reason why the moratorium has been lifted there is is still pretty structurally intact after both storms. So the need to rebuild there is is minimal, but because it was appropriate to lift the moratorium on that stretch, we, we did so. Uh, it's important to note the moratorium does remain in effect for the rest of sea pines and will likely remain in place for some time. And, and there's a couple of reasons for this. One, time is needed for the sand to reach equilibrium. So the town has completed this beach renourishment project. Obviously, there was a lot of sand directly moved in those areas. And then there are other areas in sea pines from Duck Hawk to Canvasback where no direct renourishment was done, but sand is still moving around. So time is needed for that sand to find its new level, if you will. Additionally, the town is scheduled to begin a sand fencing project sometime in January. We'll review those plans once we receive them and we'll make a determination if additional sand fencing above and beyond what the town will do is necessary by either CSA or by private owners. So the moratorium will remain in effect because, you know, after time and the sand fencing has done its job, we'll, we'll then take another look at it because if some private owners have put sand fencing up on their property and if you've been out there, you can see that the sand fencing works and it can work in a pretty short period of time. So that moratorium is in effect with the boardwalks because the whole idea of a boardwalk is to get you above grade and get that foot traffic off of the dunes so that the vegetation can grow, the roots can spread, and it offers some storm protection. If you were to put a boardwalk in many of these areas now, two feet above grade, which is the state standard, this sand is still moving. Sand fencing is yet to go in. Sand fencing will work and will change contours. So if you were to put a boardwalks in now, instead of protecting the dune long term, potentially as sand fills in around your boardwalk, should you put it in now, you have actually weakened the dune. So we do ask for you oceanfront owners to have some patience in this regard and just understand that what we're trying to do is to protect um, the long-term integrity of the dune system and our community's most valuable asset, the beach itself. All right, we'll switch gears and finish up by talking a little bit about OCRM jurisdictional lines. I had presented on this, uh, I believe it was at last month's coffee, OCRM is Office of Coastal Resource Management, and they are by statute required to set these jurisdictional lines and to revisit them every seven to ten years. You can go online, you can just search OCRM and view that video that explains their process and kind of their methodology and why they do what they do. Uh, but they did uh, propose new lines uh, not too long ago and in some areas of sea pines. And by the way, this process is for the entirety of the South Carolina coast, but we're focusing on sea pines. And these proposed lines, in some cases, changed pretty dramatically and could potentially have some impacts on those oceanfront owners. Maybe not what they have now, but what they may be able to do later should there be another event or should they choose to rebuild. And this was statewide. In some cases, these lines had moved so far on the landward side that it was across the street of the entire home, not in sea pines, but in some of their areas. And as a result of this public comment process, they received so much feedback that they decided to extend what was initially a 30-day comment period to April 6, 2018. So we have a little bit more time. Uh, because of the extension, DHEC, which OCRM is under, will begin to adopt their, their lines uh, in summer of 18 and is expected to have that process finished by, by the end of 18. So part of their uh, compromise, if you will, by de extending the public comment period was that they said, we by statute have got to adopt lines by the end of this year. And also, by the way, by statute, once those lines were adopted at the end of this year, they can no longer move seaward at any point in the future. So the adoption of the lines this year was especially critical, more so than even during their normal seven to 10 year process. 
So they did at the time the best thing they could do, and they just said, we will adopt the existing lines. So that's what they've done. Well, the thing is, is that there were some areas in sea pines where the proposed lines were seaward of the existing lines, meaning that zone of jurisdiction was proposed to go further out. We've identified those owners. It includes CSA, Parcel 1. These are areas primarily on the south end of the community, uh, Brown Pelican Road, I'd mentioned Parcel 1, and the, the uh, multi-story complexes, Sound Villas, South Beach Villas, Beachside Tennis, uh, Lands Inn, I may be forgetting one, but all of those that are in that area. So we've identified those folks and sent their information to the state so they're aware of it, and so the state can advise them of how that specific process uh, will work going forward. Uh, Hilton Head is on the tentative adoption schedule for these lines uh, towards the end of 2018. And again, if you have any more information, you can go to scdhec.gov. I've just found it more easier to search OCRM, and that'll take you straight into to what that process is and what it's about. Um, and that's all I have, so I appreciate your time. Thank you. This is really um, just disgusting to have to do this every time. <laughs> I don't remember Amanda having to do that. Um, we will n thank you, David. We will now hear from Toby, our safety, security, and transportation director. Good morning. Happy holidays. I'm glad to see Amanda had her baby. She uh, ate all the Christmas cookies before she left. Um, <laughs> she. I give her I give her a hard time, but I'm glad that they're doing well and that she's uh, they seem to be really happy. So we're we're happy for her. Uh, just a couple uh, quick updates this morning. Um, for the last couple of months, I was able to come up here and say that really a lot hasn't gone on in the community. Uh, but we have over the since the, our last meeting, we've had two burglaries here in Sea Pines. Uh, both of the the burglaries that we've had uh, were were not forced entry. Both homes. Uh, we're not exactly sure the date of the, when the burglaries actually occurred, but they had workers in the homes. Uh, some of the, one was an owner that lived full-time somewhere else, and this was a uh, second home. So workers were kind of in and out of the home, and we, we had items that come up missing. Uh, so I've, I've said this before, I encourage you, and it's, I'm sure it's probably tough for a second homeowner having work done, and you're somewhere else, probably Ohio. Uh, <clears throat> of having some work done in your home. So please do the background, make the calls, ask for references before you have someone come into your home because uh, it's, a, it's a long process if something comes up missing. You know, you, you see these trucks that ride around and said they're bonded insured. Well, that means you're getting a lawyer to go after people that were in your home that now you have things that are missing. So please do the background check before you let someone into your home and especially extended periods of time where you're not there looking at this every day. Um, so, so the burglaries, we, we have had to. Everything else, for the most part, has been uh, relatively quiet. Uh, not anything really major jumping out. Uh, we do caution you, it is the holiday season. Um, keep your homes locked. If you have an alarm, turn your alarm on. Uh, if you're going away for an extended period over the holiday season, take advantage of our service. Call the office, send us an email. I need name, address, and the dates that you're out of town, and we will send someone by to uh, take a look at your home while you're, while you're gone. Doesn't cost you anything. We pull around, we pull on your door handle, make sure water's not coming out from under the door. Uh, we, 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 we do that as a free service for us, so please take advantage of that. Um, the, the, the current world that we live in, I had just a, a, an offshoot, but I want to make mention because um, the, the criminals have gotten really smart. And most people, a lot of people today, live their life through social media. I had lunch with a friend yesterday, and when we sat down, I said, I have known where you have been. I know what you have eaten for lunch over the last two weeks because he literally posts everything. I'm driving to work. I'm at uh, Starbucks. I'm at, you know, McDonald's having lunch. I'm like, is there anything that you don't put on Facebook? So people pick up on that, especially if you have an account that's open to the general public outside of your friends that anyone can go and look. So be very cautious about 
what it is that you put out there. I have this very same conversation with my, my, my college age kids uh, <clears throat> that it's, it's out there forever. So don't advertise that you're, you're going away for any extended period. Smash and grabs if you're shopping. If you're buying stuff and put it in your car, put it in the trunk, hide it where someone just can't look in your vehicle to see something inside of your vehicle. Uh, the sheriff tells me that there has, has been some report in Bluffton in the shopping areas where they just look in the car, they crack a window, they take what's laying on the front seat, and they're gone. Uh, so be very, very cautious with that. Um, making donations. I personally do not make a donation. If you call my house and ask for something, I'm not giving it to you because I don't know who you are. If you're going to donate money, which I obviously encourage you to do that, make sure that you're seeking out the organization and that you're actually putting the money in the hands of where you really want it to go. Online scammers, if you read the Island Packet over the last two weeks, they're back at it again, identifying themselves as law enforcement officers, saying that you have unpaid tickets that you need to come by. Law enforcement does not call. After 24 years, it would be nice to say, um, Joe Thugman, we have a warrant for your arrest. Will you please come and turn yourself in? <laughs> it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Uh, if you get a call that someone identifying themselves from the Sheriff's Association asking for money, that's all a scam, and then they're, they're back at it again. Uh, be weary online uh, of where you're purchasing your stuff online. Another one that's, that's made it surface again, it's a Windows XP update. So if you operate Windows XP, it comes up as it's a Windows update. It's not because they're going to ask for your credit card information, and then next thing you know, you're getting notified that your credit card's been hit. So. Well, be very careful. Impersonating a police officer, that one, it's, um, there, it, it seems to be working um, pretty good. Um, the Tower Beach hours, we, we made some adjustments. Uh, we don't have an officer at Tower Beach currently. Uh, just There's not a lot of activity out there, and when the weather is the way it is, just no one's really going to the beach. So we're going to monitor that if we have big events coming up. Uh, we will put the officer down there and put him in place. So if you're having a big party or whatever, we'll probably you know, assign an officer down there to, to help you out during that, that time frame. On the party side, if you are having Christmas parties uh, at your home uh, and you're inviting half of Hilton Head to attend, please keep in mind the parking. Uh, notify us in advance. We'll help you. The power lines, although we have some of them blocked off and we're overseeding them, uh, you can use the power lines to, to park your guests. Um, so make sure that if you're having a function, give us a gate clearance. If you have 12 or more people attending your party that live outside of Sea Pines, you can come to dispatch or email us, and we will put a gate clearance in for you. So make sure you invite security staff to your party. <laughs> okay. But we'll help you with that. But parking is, I mean, it's a, it's a busy time of the season, and everybody's having functions. So just be, keep that in mind that we're, uh, we're trying to monitor the, the parking. If this is an issue that, we, that has come up here since we've changed the commercial decal policy, or not necessarily the commercial decal, the daily commercial entrance into sea pines. If you're a contractor or whatever your business is and you're commercial, it's a $10 fee to get into sea pines. If you have a guest, um, and I'll use the examples of what we're dealing with, we have a, a construction owner, a man who owns a construction company, has a teenage kid, was coming into Sea Pines to pick up another teenage kid to have a play date or whatever, going to a ball game. Um, at the security gates, if you come in and you have a blue pass, which is issued from a property owner, which calls in the pass, that's a red flag for us. That's, that's us thinking that the, a that the property owner is calling a pass in for a commercial operator that you're not allowed to do. And we stop those. So you can imagine how the exchange goes when the contract's like, well, I'm going to pick up my, my son's friend. Well, that barely may be the case. So if you have someone that's a friend of yours that is in a commercial business that has a magnetic sign or they, they drive an F-250 pulling a landscape trailer and they're coming to your house to pick your kid up, we need to know. Because uh, we, don't, we don't allow contractors to pick up blue passes that are called in by property owners. That's, that's the policy. Uh, so if you have that, we, we obviously... This happens, and we, we don't want to delay this at the gate or have the issue. So if you'll let us know that in advance, we can, we can help remedy that. Um, decal renewal, which is a, really the last thing that I have, that is coming up starting in January. It's not for the property owner. So January 2nd, you don't have to get up bright and early and come to our office. It's not for the property owner. It's for everyone else, long-term renters, 
uh, C-Pines employees, your relatives, and I'm going to talk about the relatives, your Hilton Head prep, that kind of stuff. That's what we're renewing in January, not the property owners. We're probably going to catch you guys the following January. We're going to implement the new ABDI software and system. So when we bring you in, we're going to give you a brand new ABDI uh, uh, ID card and new decals that are probably embedded with some type of technology. So the January decal is not for you. Relatives, we do need an affidavit filled out by the property owner or an email with your information on it that will go to admin office at cpinesecurity.com that if you have, and I'm going to list it out here, um, a son, a daughter, a grandson, granddaughter, father, mother, grandfather, grandmother, sister, brother, good Lord. <clears throat> if in one of those categories, they are able to get a relative decal issued by CSA, they get one. So if you have five kids, your five kids get five decals. Now, if, if Sally Sue has five vehicles, she can't get five decals, one for each vehicle. We only issue the one, and it's $6 per decal, but you have to send the affidavit to CSA authorizing this person to have a decal because we do have property owners who don't want their kids to have a decal. <clears throat> so please, um, if you want them to have them, not a problem. We'll issue them. And, uh, and each kid, we used to, it used to be one. Now if, if all of your kids need want a decal, they're able to, to get one. That starts January 2nd, and we'll go through roughly around the 21st is when that deadline gets cut off for the commercial as well. And I think that's, uh, that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thanks, Toby. Uh, five minutes, and we'll be right back here. Remember, David and Gene will have the microphones. Oh, Sarah is. Okay, I'm sorry, Sarah. We'll have microphones to come to you so you can ask your question. Before we get into the questions and answers, Charlie Miner asked for a, a brief announcement. So, Charlie? Hi. Um, I wanted to make a comment about the article that appeared in the Island Packet uh, yesterday. Um, the Island Packet usually gets it right, but they made a little bit of a mistake in that one. Um, and I contacted Alex, um, and she said she would uh, alter that. I looked in today's paper, it wasn't altered. Uh, it's a relatively um, sort of minor type of thing. I didn't mean to use a pun there. But in her article, uh, we talked about the, uh, what was called the record date for voting. So ASPO members needed to be members uh, by the record date in order to be eligible to vote. She uh, commented on the 52 ballots uh, that were not members by the record date and said those votes came from both sides of the aisle. Um, I did not say that. Um, that was her intention, or that was her, what she wrote. Uh, there's no way I can know where those votes came from. And I just wanted to reiterate uh, the great effort we put into confidentiality uh, in voting. Um, what I did say was pressure to vote came from both sides of the aisle, and she c converted that to votes from both sides of the aisle. Um, we do not know who voted, we don't know how they voted, um, and I was particularly careful that when the board had its meeting that we didn't even know who the members involved were because I didn't want any kind of an indication uh, that we would bias uh, our decision based on prior knowledge. So I just wanted to make that comment. Uh, once again, I asked Alex to retract that, and perhaps she will tomorrow, but that was my comment. Yeah. Uh, Charles, just a question. If you don't know who voted, how did you know to pull the 52 votes that were submitted by people who weren't <coughs> members of ASWA as, as of the date of record? Good question. Uh, we didn't pull the 52 votes. We pulled the 52 people who joined ASPO after November 1st. So whether they voted or how they voted, we don't know. The board did not know who those people were at the time it took its action. After it took its action, I asked uh, the uh, ASPO 
administration people to uh, notify those people that uh, if they had uh, joined ASPO just to vote, that they were permitted to get a, a refund on their membership if they wanted to. So um, we don't know who they were at the time we made that decision. All we, we don't know how they voted. We don't know if they voted. I mean, all we know is, and you're, you're correct. Isn't there a number on each ballot so that you know without looking at the person who voted? Because that's what the system Well, that's correct, and that's how we keep it. Well, let me, you don't have a microphone, but I'll just repeat the question. Uh, is there a number on every ballot? Yes, there's a number on every ballot. Why is there a number on every ballot? Well, a number of people threw their ballots out, and then they called up and said, oops, um, I lost my ballot, so we gave them a new ballot. They got the same number that they did the last time. So when the CPA counts the ballots, all the CPA has is the number. He does not have the name of the person. So if the number shows up twice, those ballots don't count because you can't vote twice. You can only vote once. So each number is allowed one vote. So the CPA doesn't know who the people are, and we don't know how the numbers voted. So there's that wall between the two uh, that maintains confidentiality. So if all 53 voted, those ballots may still be in the system, or were they withdrawn from the vote tally? We advised the CPA, Elliot Davis, the numbers that were ineligible and were to be removed from the total tally count. Okay, so they've so, been removed? Yes. Okay. If, the, if they voted. We don't know if they voted. I assume they did. Wait, Sue, get the... Um, Charlie, the ASPO bylaws require that the ballots be received by December 1st. Are you going to change that? Because everything said you had to mail it by December 1st. If any ASPO ballot, technically, if any ASPO ballots were received after December 1st, but mailed on December 1st, I guess you're November counting. November 1st. No, no. Mailed on November 1st. No, no. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, okay. At, to be it, counted. No. Uh, the ASPO bylaws are different from the CSA bylaws Correct. in that matter. Correct. So we are going to ignore or our ASPO ballots counted if they are received after December 1st. So here's the, here was the received. discussion on that point. Um, the ASPO bylaws require that the ballots be provided to the voters by November 1st. So somebody says, well, how do you provide them? We mail them. So the mail takes some time to get to their house, so that truncates the time in which they have to respond. So we interpreted provided to be mailed. Then the bylaws say return by December 1st. So we said since we decided to provide them by the mailing date, we will accept them as returned by the mailing date to be consistent. That is a typical uh, problem with the ASPO bylaws, which need to be revised. Unfortunately, the board has no authority to revise the bylaws. The only way the bylaws can be, re um, can be altered is by the membership. The only time the membership meets to do those things is at the annual meeting. I assure you that by this annual meeting, we will have a new set of bylaws for people to take a look at and we'll get them out to people so they can see the changes that we intend to make because that's just one of many issues uh, in the bylaws that reflect something that was written 20, 30 years ago and has never been updated. Other questions? Uh, thank you, Brett. Uh, could you ask Mark Griffith to come to the stand sure. and give us a summary of, of what was uh, decided at the uh, special meeting of the CSA board? Mark? Yes. Um, there were two pieces of business, you hear me, uh, before the CSA board yesterday. Um, one involved um, providing to the town of Hilton Head 
a access right uh, to do improvements at the town's expense uh, for the intersection of Greenwood Drive and Office Park Road. That is work that we've been talking to the town about for the last two and a half years. Uh, that intersection, um, from a traffic perspective, failed in the traffic study that was done when the town um, agreed to build the and fund the USCB uh, hospitality campus. So these are improvements that are associated with that. Um, it's not going to solve all the problems at that intersection, but it will greatly enhance. And as David said, that's one of the top four issues that we as a, a, a community have uh, with traffic. The second um, or piece of business was the board agreed and authorized Brett to proceed to purchase a piece of property that's uh, it's known as the gallery shops. Uh, it is just outside uh, the CSA gates um, on the, call that the north side or northeast side of the street. If you take the left going into the Publix Island Shopping Center, it's on your left. It's in terrible state of repair. Um, we believe it's a strategic piece of property that will aid in solving many of our traffic and gate issues. Um, and we felt it was something that uh, we needed to control. So that occurred yesterday. Oh, sorry. A letter of intent, which isn't with... with, with no, we, he's been authorized to execute a purchase agreement and close on the property. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I was at the meeting and I... I, I LOI, sorry. purchase contract, closing and funding. That was all approved yesterday. Okay, yeah. Dana? I assume this is the same topic. <laughs> yes, it is. So we, ha we have not seen the results of the gate survey yet, but we know what the top four worries were sure. among all of us. And I think that a lot of us said that we wanted a, a kiosk to dispense uh, gate passes. It looks like we've ended up with a shopping mall. It's a very large purchase. Wait, wait. It's a very large purchase. Could you explain briefly what you think that building is going to be used for and how? Let me make the following comments. There are there is a task force that has been working on these issues for the last several months. As was mentioned earlier, we will come to the community with the options and the solutions to deal with those key measure, major issues over the coming couple of months. Um, we believe, uh, because we've done substantial studies, that this property will be an important part of solving those issues. And we will bring that to you when we've completed our work. The, the diligence that's been done, which includes appraisal, environmental, easements, access, who has approval, all that work has been done. And if by some chance it comes to be that that is not an asset that we should own, we'll put it back on the market and sell it. But we felt like we needed to control that property today. Sue. <laughs> I just want to know how we're going to fund it, the purchase, because obviously we're running at a $1.2 million deficit on the proposed budget without this in. In the short term, uh, we all pay our assessments in January, or we're, most of us do anyway. <laughs> So from a cash flow perspective, we will have more than enough cash in the near term to fund this acquisition. Um, as we move through the year uh, and find ourselves in need of that cash that we used on the front end to fund the acquisition, as, as Brett showed you, we've got nearly $9 million in reserves. Those, uh, those, fund, those assets are invested in, a, in an account with Morgan Stanley. 
and we have the ability to borrow at a very, very, very favorable interest rate against those assets. So in the short term, we'll use cash flow. As that cash is required for operations towards the latter part of next, next year, we can borrow against uh, those assets. I, actually, I have one other question, but that's for Brett. <laughs> and that's Okay, is there anything else on that subject? <laughs> Thank you. When are we going to get the, we're, we're going to have another two surveys, but we still haven't gotten the results from the referendum survey, as far as I know. That's correct. And, and we did have a discussion on that at an executive ago, session. Yeah. And the, the board has directed me not to pursue the provider. We do not. No. We, we never had the data, we never had the summary, we got a preliminary summary. No. That's correct, based on the current board's direction to me. Um, it looks like you all have started and are proceeding with correcting the you know, results that we've seen from the hydrology study, um, but there doesn't seem to be a schedule of repairs. It looks to me like you're starting in Harbortown. Have you created a schedule for 2018 and have you budgeted out what we're going to be spending on that and when it will be happening and what will be happening? Sure. Um in regards to the map that was on the screen, I was just simply trying to show you uh, in that exhibit where it showed Harbor Town. It was just to give a, a sense of what the infrastructure is. Currently, the town of Hilton Head has a $650,000 approved 2018 budget to address the stormwater control structures. We're currently working on the town and developing additional service requests for 2019. Um, there's probably another uh, a solid, another two dozen requests that we're currently preparing. It involved ditch clean out, uh, control structure repair, things of that nature. Uh, again, the in initial service request for 2018 or something the town's going to be moving forward on this coming season. Uh, in regards to your, your question about schedule, um, you know, the stormwater crew is, is going to be a, a new piece of the CSA operation. So, um, you know, we have to get this up and going and uh, work through the, you know, the com community in a smart way. Uh, we'll be working on developing those schedules to address priorities. Uh, we have priorities priorities that have about been addressed in the stormwater study. Uh, we look to you know go, uh, handle those first, and um, those are laid out in that study. So um, again, this is this is something that's going to take many months and many years ahead of us to, to uh, make some inroads on. You have a system that's aging; pipes need to be replaced. Um, you know, we, uh, and so forth. So there's, there's a lot to do um, for the next, you know, 20 some odd years, quite frankly. Okay. Sorry, one last joinder onto that. Will the areas that flooded during Irma, so around, around Ren Drive and the folks who live down that way, will you be addressing that this year? Yeah, um, yeah to, to answer that question, uh, down around, we have done some, some work around Wren Pond, and uh, there's some additional drainage work that we're doing down there. Back off of Wren Drive, there's additional pipe that we're installing later this season down there. Um, to, you know, to go back to Irma, uh, you know, the tidal inundation that we saw, everything that was below that 7.6 foot elevation mark went underwater, but uh, you know, we're making every effort to uh, clear these pipes out um, down, down in that community. So. Just to add to that, that, that major issue at Wren Pond was a result of a, what was that, 36 inch, 48, 36 inch pipe that was totally blocked. Probably a lot from previous sediment, but the storm added a lot as well. And we had to excavate that pipe uh, to, well, actually we went to the side of it first and allowed that water to drain around the pipe that was blocked. And then one of those uh, extractor, uh, a very large extractor came in and they cleared the pipe to get that to flow. Uh, so that was the, the major issue. And we did that shortly after that occurred. Okay. Yes. 
Back to the referendum survey. It was funded by the resort? We, we didn't pay for it, yes. My understanding, they paid okay. for it. Who is not allowing the data to be given to us? The resort or the company that they paid? The company did not, would not provide the uh, data to us to, or the information. Have they provided it to the resort? Uh, I, I don't know. I believe so. So the resort, in, in effect, is not sharing the data with us? As far as I know, that's correct. We have to stop giving them our email addresses until they play fair. Well, again, we provided it to our provider. Our provider didn't provide it back to us. Okay, let me get this straight with the referendum survey. We didn't pay for it, but our emails were used for it. Our emails were provided to our provider who did the survey. Our provider did the survey using our emails for a commercial entity? For the purposes of a community referendum. But I'm not allowed to have them? Well, we don't have them. We do not have the, the results, so I can't provide them. Uh, uh, Brett, I'm not sure I'm directing the question to uh, the right person, but I'll try. Um, the Sea Pines Forest Preserve. Um, the, um, th this is the, uh, the, new, the new pamphlet, and this, this is the one it superseded. But between the two, there's been some very significant changes in the narrative. I, I'm not sure who's responsible for it, uh, but in the new pamphlet, it says, it is the prized possession of every sea pines property owner. The previous pamphlet m made the point that the resort has had an obligation since 1993 to transfer 404 acres to the Forest Preserve, i.e. us. It was mentioned in the term sheet of the referendum. And as far as I'm aware, it's never happened. But this brochure is saying it has happened. And secondly, it's also removed reference to the farm and is actually a very neat marketing brochure for some activities going on in the preserve. And it does say that we receive a percentage of the revenue. Has there been some significant changes over the past 12 months of which we're not aware? No. Other than that, and I'm, David, you may know more about the, the brochure than I do. I wasn't aware of any edits that were changed. Yeah, uh, CSA is re or I am responsible for that brochure and that change that you're referring to was some years ago. It's not a recent change from that to that and it was a complete uh, working with the previous previous communications person uh, developed that brochure as in an effort to make it more colorful and, and more useful. That was all done internally working with the communications coordinator at the time, but that was some years ago that that was done. David, I picked this up on, on, the, uh, on my cycle rides earlier this year. It's possible there was some old stock that got put out, but I can get you the exact date, but it was at least five years ago, if not longer, that that change was made. Well, whenever it was, David, with the greatest respect, it's not correct, is it? In what regard? We'll, we'll take a look at it. I mean, we haven't seen it. Didn't come up before, so. Understood. Okay. One question. Is sure. this on? Okay, one yes. question. When did you put the street light at the end of Plantation Drive? Street light at the end of Plantation Drive. Russell, you know anything about that? Has it? We don't go there very often, but we went to a party in Sea Pines in Harbortown last week, and the, uh, we seldom use 
Plantation Drive. When we got to the end of Plantation Drive, my husband said, oh my God, there's a, <laughs> there's a street light. I mean, what was the rationale for that? I didn't think we had street lights in Sea Pines. No, it's not Christmas lights, it's a street light. Are you, are you, are you talking about the street light that's right behind the hollies by the uh, kiosk? There's a, there's a the pole there. At the plantation drive yeah, and um, that, that, here. You, you there was a light out there. And lighthouse. Here, oh. do you want this? She lives in the area. Do you want this? Yeah. That street light's been there for at least two years, yeah. if not a little bit longer. I forget, I forget my thing. And I think the reason it was put there is because several times automobiles or trucks or whatever went right through the plantings that were at the end of, planta of plantation drive and... and mm -hmm. uh, uh, right right so, yeah. but it's not, it is not anything new. It has been there. It's new to me. It's yeah. I never go to Harvard. Uh, I don't go that well, way. I, I, I go, that, go way. that way several, several times a day. So. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing new about the, there was actually a bulb that was out that we recently fixed, so. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Anything back in the back there? Um, I guess this is a question for Mark uh, about the acquisition of the gallery shops. Um, one of the sticking points or one of the complaints some people had about the negotiations with the resort on the referendum was the lack of transparency. Right. The, uh, you know, all the negotiations at the resort's request were done in secret or in, in private and we yeah, were kind of presented with a sure. fait accompli. Which committees have been involved in the decisions or the study of the purchase of those shops? Did the, the Long Range Planning Committee do anything or in, consider it? Did the Gate Committee? You know, who made the decisions to proceed with this? There's a, there's a traffic and gate configuration task force that's charged uh, with reviewing those circumstances. The opportunity and the availability of this site came up, Brett, August, September. Um, it, had, uh, it had been on the market far, far before that, but at a very, very substantial number that just made absolutely no sense. Um, we felt like it would, in fact, be a part of the solution. Of that task force has looked at it as a part of the solution, um, and that's how putting it under under letter of intent, tent, and putting it under contract and doing the diligence came about. Uh, task force, you know, we got three engineers: uh, Michael, myself, Michael. Who else on that? Task force was made up primarily of. Uh, engineers, traffic engineers. Uh, we had Mr. Birdwell on from the resort. We had Mr. King on from the commercial. Um, Paul Crunkleton, who headed up the ASPO uh, organization piece for the Circle to Circle, was merged into this committee. So the fellow, from club, the fellow from Club Course POA, President uh, Frank, Jeffries, Frank Jeffries, because the Club Course can maintains 950 of our home sites out of our 5,890, and a lot of the issues came out of Club Course. So we asked Frank Jeffries, the president of the POA, there to serve on that gate configuration task force as well. And and the reason this transpired over these past months, and that we didn't discuss this with you, is we were bound like with the resort, bound by a confidentiality with the seller. Um, we went to the sellers and asked that they release us from the confidentiality to at least be able to communicate to you the site in question. But we're not permitted until we close to tell you anything more about it. Thank you. Um, Diedrich. One, one more just sure. follow up to that. Is that a property that the resort could exercise the right of first refusal on, and have they waived that right? They have waived that right, okay. and I personally have not seen the deed, but I understand from our council that they do have that preemptive right. Yes. Diedrich? It seems that we um, 
shoot ourselves in the foot and then we're ready to reload in terms of transparency. And so what I would like to ask CSA is when you talk about uh, strategic reasons for doing this, to be as elaborate as you possibly can um, before things come down the pike. Can you tell us what the strategic impact, besides having a, a, a ticket uh, pass office there, uh, this property would have for us as property owners? Yes, in due, due course, we will, in due time we will do that, but not today. Other questions? The electronic signs at the uh, entrances. We're, we're, where are we, David? We're in the permitting process currently. Uh, we're waiting on a provider to get the equipment and to do the in installation. If, if I could just add to that, Brett, the, the recent delay has been in that the provider that we're using, which is the same provider that has uh, worked with other communities on the island that you may be familiar with that have these same signs, there has been a change in technology where it's better, cheaper, thinner, lighter, uh, that we are exploring. We believe we've identified the best new product uh, for our application, and our local provider is getting set up with the manufacturer, which is actually in the state of South Carolina, uh, as a vendor so that we can move forward what we believe is the is the best technology for this application Other questions Hold on wait wait till we get you on and I guess I'll go to Toby for it. maybe or you have the ideas or or the no Who's allowed to come through that gate? for nothing the that's school a, bus that's, there's, comes through for There's a very listen. large list, and if you look at our um, um, gate pass policy, you'll see most of those uh, types of entities identified. So it goes from public officials to clergy to a variety of different uh, opportunities for people to come through the gate. Um, there's benefits for the resort and their customers, uh, individual property owners who call in, guest friends, uh, those come through. You know, there, there's, you know, it's pretty much anybody. I mean, it's open. It's open to the public. We do restrict that. Uh, we don't sell any passes after what time, Tob? 11 o'clock. So that type of entry uh, is stopped at that and doesn't start back till 7. So, so some, some contractors have to pay and other contractors don't. Some contractors pay by, by annual pass. So they'll buy a certificate of some, uh, a tag that they can put on their vehicle and they come straight through, but they paid for that access entry. I don't know of any contractors other than possibly uh, uh, resort, resort related uh, contractors that uh, have free access. Utilities. Utilities. There so we go. a resort has the opportunity to have all their people come through. For by nothing. covenant and by right. But as a property owner, if you want to have something come through like a landscaper that does not have a pass, has to pay the they money. They pay. Yes. That's a good deal. How do I get the rest of it? <laughs> well, it's an assignment Brett, of right. Brett, a, a follow-up yes. on that, that line of thought. There's a resort over off uh, Marsh uh, Creek, a new, a new subdivision that's going in. And as a part of their advertising, they are saying their residents have access to sea pines. Is, did they buy passes? I mean, how does that work? They, they have not purchased any passes from us. There are people who are on Hilton Head, who live on Hilton Head, have uh, an ability to purchase an annual pass. Or pay daily. So their 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 advertising is false. They quit advertising. We've asked them to okay. okay I, Thank I, you. I notified Steve Brookhill. They were using the license permit, which is against uh, all kinds of rules because they own it. And I believe they took care of getting the lighthouse image off of the 
the, and also I believe there was a big outcry. There was a lot of talk about this on Facebook and other yeah. social media, and I believe that they bowed to pressure from I, somebody in yeah, CSA, they, I think, talked to them. As Maybe far as we know, Toby. they've stopped. I talked to you, Toby, too, yeah. and um, I think it stopped. The, uh, the resort as well as, as CSA communicated with this. He's actually a small builder. I, it's not a large community, but apparently, and this, before my time, this is not the first time this builder has gone about using this marketing ploy, but he's been advised by the resort and CSA to cease, and I believe they have. Yeah. Anything else? All right, then. Have a great holiday. We'll see you next year.